to be here, and it's a pleasure to share the platform with these amazing panelists, and you guys will hear from them afterwards. And uh, it was an honor also when Yolanda asked me to speak on such a subject, because it is a very dark subject, and it's something that Jewish or non-Jewish, if, if you oppose hatred of, of any kind, any people group, and especially if you understand, this is one of, it's been called the oldest hatred, one of the oldest hatreds in human history, recorded human history, if you connect with that, then it becomes something that you need to be passionate about. So purely if you just want to love human beings and acknowledge that these people are, all, are human beings. And so this is something that Bridges for Peace fiercely stands against, anti-Semitism. Of course, with Bridges for Peace, we're a, a bridge between the Christian world and the Jewish world. So much of the education on anti-Semitism uh, comes from educating the church on historic and modern Christian anti-Semitism. So, but this was uh, something that I right away eagerly accepted when Yolanda um, said, can you come and speak? And uh, something that I wanted to really dig into. And uh, I won't go any more about Bridges for Peace. There's some literature at the back so you can familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with what we do. Um, but before I get into France, I want to just talk a little bit about, very briefly, about anti-Semitism of today. Um, historically, I mean, you can see anti-Semitism in the pagan world. You can see anti-Semitism, of course, in the, in the Christian world, in the communist world, in the Islamic world. Um, the term, whether you're describing anti-Judaic or a Jew hatred or these things, the term anti-Semite, it's interesting that it, it was uh, devised by a German man named Wilhelm Marr in 1881, who was a rabid anti-Semite and a political agitator and publicist in Germany. And here is a picture of the way to victory of Germanism over Judaism in 1879. And so this is not a new thing. Uh, they just basically gave it a word, anti-Semitism. But like I said, it's one of the oldest hatreds in the world. When we look at how anti-Semitism has morphed, of course, it's Jew hatred. And it maybe shifts, but there's the same things that seem to stand in as key tenets. And when you look at all forms, you, it's like Jews are hated for being rich, Jews are hated for being poor, Jews are hated for being religious, Jews are hated for being atheists, Jews are hated for being Zionists, or Jews. It's, it spans the globe. You even have countries that hate Jews that have never had Jews living among them. So it, it's quite a fascinating thing when you start digging into it, and it's very disturbing at the same time. Um, but we have religious anti-Semitism which is really what we saw in the, the medieval ages, is what we see a lot today with uh, radical Islam, a religious anti-Semitism, and still among some of the church. Uh, you know, maybe it's gone undercover a little bit or quieter, and, or it expresses itself in different um, opinions or thoughts, but it's still there. Then it, we see a morph, when you look through history, into modern anti-Semitism, um, which paves the way for Hitler. It's like this racial anti-Semitism. It kind of... It, kind of ceases in some ways being a religious motivator. But how did they believe that the Jews were evil? Well, they had, that had come through the Catholic or Protestant church movements. And so by the time you have the Renaissance and humanism and secularism, to them, they may not uh, compare, oh, Jews as the offspring of Satan or some diabolical theological uh, opinion. But to them, Jews are now inferior racially, and we need to eliminate them. Well, it's amazing when you look at how history has shifted now because we have the birth of the modern state of Israel, the rebirth, which posed a lot of problems for theological anti-Semites and other people because now there's a Jewish state. And so when you look at global anti-Semitism, it, it shifted in certain ways, but Israel in way, many ways became the metaphorical Jew. And it's when you examine anti-Semitism in history, um, when you look back and, and you look at anti-Semitism of saying, Oh, Jews, uh, you know, they poisoned wells, or they kidnapped children, or they start wars, or they control governments. Uh, it's okay to criticize Israel. There's a healthy form of criticism to any democracy. But then when you put Israel on an impossible standard and people start saying Israel is like pulling the strings of governments, or if we could only solve this one conflict, the entire world would be at peace. So Israel is the root cause of, the con of, of conflict in general. And so it, it shifts and it changes, but that underlying thing um, usually stays the same. And Natan Sharinsky talked about the three Ds of anti-Semitism, and he used these three Ds 
kind of in comparison of how do we know if a critic of Israel is really kind of a closet anti-Semite? Because you could be critical of Israel. I've been critical of Israel in the past. I'm sure all of you have been critical of Israel or policies or things like this. But when you look at these three Ds that he brought out, delegitimizing, you know, it's, you know, you're not saying anything about North Korea or Iran or anything else. It's Israel has no right to exist. And Israel, with these types of people, is usually synonymous with Jew. Uh, demonization, you know, they, the, the, the amazing accusations and the things that they create or the caricatures of Israelis, um, they uh, will make them very stereotypically Jewish. And doing things like eating human pe uh, beings or drinking their blood, or it's like, it's just, they're monsters. They, cr they create them, dehumanize them, which is the final one, and create them, to, in them into something that is not human. Like, like uh, and so it's, it's an incredible thing. Now, I want to uh, take this time to really split up this discussion into three stories. I'm going to reflect back, and these three stories all happen and focus on the Jewish community in France. In the 19th century, we all know, many of us may have known, about the Dreyfus Affair. You read about it in Paris. And this is an example of past anti-Semitism. Captain Alfred Dreyfus, he was a French-Jewish artillery officer, and he was accused of spying. He was accused of spying for Germany and sending French military secrets, basically, to the, to the German embassy in Paris. He underwent a humiliating trial in 1894, and he was imprisoned on Devil's Island in France for five years, and it wasn't until a little bit later that evidence came to light in 1896 that didn't, quite, uh, didn't acquit Dreyfus until 1899. So he spent five years in prison, and he was released. And the evidence that came up the, that the charges of imprisonment were very obvious that it was trumped up because he was Jewish. And some of the evidence to this was the Parisians, the people of Paris, marching through the streets saying, kill the Jews, down with the Jews, like this whole foment, this expression of, of hatred came out, and as they said in the video, and you've probably heard even with the build-up uh, to the Holocaust, where Jews were shocked, like Jews thought, the Jews of Germany thought they were more German than the Germans, and the, the Jews of France, like the gentleman said on there, we consider ourselves French Jews, but to these people were just Jews. And, you know, they were the, the pinnacle of culture and civilization and artists and writers and philosophers. These were core people. Yet it doesn't matter. They're Jews. And it's an, an amazing thing. I believe it was um, um, Ida Weichmann who, uh, who was asked about early on with the ghettos. He was asked about, well, what about the children in the ghettos? And he said, there are no children in the ghettos, just small Jews. And so this dehumanizing mentality and approaching it and disconnecting, if they're not human, if this is just extermination. You know, if they're not human, they're fair game. We can say whatever we want. We could fly whatever flag we want, and we can destroy synagogues. We can do these kinds of things, and they're fair game. And the amazing thing at the Dreyfus uh, affair was the Austro-Hungarian journalist, we all know it, Theodor Herzl, who witnessed this and was so shocked that Paris, of all places, the cradle of civilization, um, culture, absolutely everything, romance, that th this whole city, this place could just be brought to such a low where um, basically, you know, with hatred spewing out of the streets. And he, of course, knew what was going on in Russia with the pogroms. And this is the, the, really the basis that uh, forms his Jewish state. You know, we need a place to, to protect ourselves, to self-determination. And, and there's a whole history behind that. I'm not going to go into that. But this was an amazing thing. If the Jews of France could be brought so low and suspected and accused so quickly of treason when they had lived there for centuries and were French in every area of the word, the only answer was a Jewish state for Herzl. When we look at it, it's just so disturbing. I, one of the things that I re, was researching was a, a document, Anti-Semitic Violence in Europe, between 2005 and 2015. This was... Uh, a Norwegian scholar who is looking at France, UK, Germany, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Russia. And he's he basically, he, he's roughly polling about 2,000 Jews in these countries from various backgrounds and various, living in various uh, circumstances. And the evidence that he 
unloads off of that is, is quite startling. Um, and France just like peaks. Um, you know, it's, and he calculates when he adds up uh, a lot of the anti-Semitic incidences, um, France hits over 4,000, <coughs> estimated count 4,000 uh, and 92. So this is since 2005 and 2015, 4,092 estimated counted anti-Semitic incidences. This isn't just saying stuff, this is physical. Uh, killing incidents, nine killed in that period. The next one below that is the United Kingdom at 3,844. And then when you go down to Germany, 1917, 1,917. And then Sweden at 516. So it's just a remarkable amount when you look at the anti-Semitism in these nations. And then he, he, goes, he, he drives it home even closer because then he starts polling Jewish people living in these places and asking them certain questions like, how safe do you feel? Um, do you, is there someone that you know or have you yourself experienced anti-Semitic incidents personally or know somebody in the last year? And, and he gives it a scale like out of 10. And 9.4 French Jews have either experienced this or know somebody uh, that has experienced this. And, um, and then like his questions, how often do you avoid visiting Jewish events or sites because you do not feel safe as a Jew there or on the way there? Do you ever avoid wearing caring or displaying things that might help people recognize you as a Jew in public. France it just keeps hitting these high numbers everything, every time. And some of these, the other countries are like very minimal and France just spikes. So something big is happening there. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I pulled from this, and I don't have time to go through it, it's a little bit exhaustive, but one of the interesting things I pulled from it, because we will talk about uh, Islamic, radical Islamic anti-Semitism happening in France is that what he found is that Muslims are different in different places. So he found the anti-Semitic incidents in Russia was from either alt-left or alt-right non-Muslim people. That was, even though Russia has this, a large Muslim population, it was lower from uh, Islamic anti-Semitism. However, Western Europe, it was the opposite. So it, it, it really, what his findings would say was be, you know, it really, if you're a Muslim, it depends also where you're from, what community and culture you're coming from. So perhaps Muslims of Algeria or Libya are expressing themselves far more anti-Semitically than Muslims of Uzbekistan or Georgia or some of these other places. So I thought that was quite interesting, um, that uh, the background, simply where the the, if we're looking at Islamic anti-Semitism, simply the country of origin and the community can also vary of expression, anti-Semitic expression. Um, so there are some very interesting things. <laughs> also in the study is that it's not always Israel related. So it's, it's an interesting thing that a lot of the anti-Semitism that explodes in these, a number of these European countries and even in our own in, in the United States, often it's like Israel is the excuse. But his studies say, of course, yeah, when there's tumultuous things happening in Israel, there is a spike. But, there, but it's, not, it's, all, it's not always related. And so on that video you saw, that was actually an uh, anti-government protest. It had nothing to do with Israel. And the, march, the marchers started chanting, Jew, Jew, down with the Jews, and just like going off. They're not like, you know, they're not flying Hamas flags, or they're not having this pro-Palestinian march. It just explodes, because uh, it's from within the community. Um, and then the also, like, look at this picture. And he's doing a, a, the, the Hitler a salute at Auschwitz. So it's, it's just uh, incredible when you, look at the, when you look at some of this stuff. And simply, I was actually literally emotionally disturbed when I was on Google. If you want to be emotionally disturbed, just go on Google and type in uh, anti-Semitism in France or anti-Semitic cartoons. And it's just pages and pages and pages uh, of, of things. 
And so the second story, and you heard about it a little bit in the video, Toulouse, March 19th, 2012, following the killing of two paratroopers and wounding a third in Mont Bon, uh, Mohamed Mera drove his motorcycle to Toulouse. He arrived at Ozar Hatora School, which is part of a national chain of 20 Jewish schools in France. Mera dismounted his motorcycle and opened fire toward the schoolyard. The first victim was a rabbi and a teacher who was shot at the school gates as he tried to shield his two young sons from Mera. Mera shot both boys as well. Mera then chased people into the building. Inside the school, he shot at staff, parents, and students. He chased an eight-year-old girl into the courtyard, caught her by the hair, and raised a gun to shoot her. The gun jammed at this point. He changed weapons and shot the girl in the temple at point-blank range. Mera retrieved his motorcycle and rode away. Four people were killed. 30-year-old Rabbi Jonathan Sandler, his two oldest out of three children, Aria, aged six, and Gabriel, aged three, and eight-year-old Miriam Monasego, daughter of the head teacher. Um, and then uh, the boy, uh, boy, Brian Bejou, a 17-year-old Jewish boy, was shot and gravely injured at the school. And this was the worst school-related attack in French history. Mohamed Mera was hunted down and killed by police in a siege on March 22nd. The third story, January 9th, 2015. Boy, two, two, two years. Two days after the Charlie Hebdo Paris attack, which killed six journalists uh, and cartoonists, a terrorist, a terrorist claiming to operate on behalf of ISIS stormed the hyper kosher supermarket of Paris. Um, Amde Kobali uh, killed four Jewish patrons and held 15 other hostages during the siege. Police stormed the supermarket and killed the terrorist. President Francois Hollande described the event as a terrifying act of anti-Semitism. So the President of France, Israel's Foreign Minister, Foreign Affairs Minister, Avigdor Lieberman, issued a statement saying the attacks were not just against the French people or French Jews, they're against the entire free world. This is another attempt by the dark forces of radical Islam to unleash horror and terror on the West. The entire international community must stand strong and, and determined in the face of this terror. Despite repeated pledges by the French government, very vocal pledges at times, to curb anti-Semitic violence and its presence in France, it continues to grow. Um, and we always remember these, the marches, we remember all, uh, people changing their Facebook profile to the, the, the flag of France, the signs, the rallies, incredible solidarity, very visually stimulating. People identifying with the Jewish people of France. But no change, no change. And this is the interesting thing, no change. And now this has become at, at major Jewish uh, sites, uh, uh, Chabad houses and synagogues, and especially during uh, certain high holy days, Yom Kippur and practically all the other feasts in large Jewish concentrations, we're seeing armed guards or ramped up security. I was uh, e even just in London not too long ago near Golders Green, the Jewish areas, and the presence of armed police, um, not just walking around with sidearms, but you know, automatic weapons and body armor and big barricades on the, on the roads around major tourist sites. Like this is becoming the norm, which interestingly <coughs> enough, Israel has faced for a long time. We know that the awful stories of, of car rammings and different things like that happening in Israel. So one of the major factors in anti-Semitic violence lies in the reality of radical Islamic elements which have penetrated Western Europe through immigration and the refugee influx from the chaos in Syria and other countries with varying degrees of instability and violence. This is not saying all the refugees or all the immigrants, but when you have countries that have experienced heavy amounts of radicalism in the past, Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, these kinds of groups, some of these nations that, like Syria, is in a permanent state of war with Israel, the, the Syrian government, there's a ceasefire there. And when you have these groups coming in, you're bound to have uh, an influx. And so this is what France, one of the key issues that France has been facing. Like I said, Russia, it's a little bit different with Russia. 
Some other countries, the, the levels of extremism vary and from what groups they're coming from. But we're talking about France, and this is uh, where a lot of it is exploding from, the, the Muslim community. And not every community is uh, made in the same image, but it's coming out of much of the Muslim community. So, like I said, waves of anti-Semitism today may have changed as far as the excuse or cause. I mean, maybe many of you have heard, you know, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Israel. You know, if you kind of dig a little bit deep there, you find out, hmm, you know, if, if that holds up in a court of law. Um, but they are related through the same historic pattern and foundation, anti-Semitism. And here's an example. So this is a, a medieval Christian caricature. Um, you can call it that, a cartoon of the medieval ages showing uh, a, the blood libel. The, the lie that Jews go out and steal Christian children, drain their blood, and use it for matzah. This had a lot of, uh, this, these kinds of lies got a lot of Jews uh, murdered and a lot of Jewish communities destroyed and sacked um, because of angry Christians that would believe these things because, well, that's what Jews do, right? They already believe it. It's already a heart issue. Well, this is, look at this. This is a modern uh, cartoon from the, the Palestinian Authority. This comes out of, Palestinian Media Watch is an organization in Israel both made up of Israeli Arabs and Jews that basically watch all streaming from the Arab, Arab world and simply translate it and, and use, the, they'll, you know, they'll inspect their uh, school books and all kinds of things. And so this is from uh, the Palestinian Authority um, that, uh, you know, an Israeli soldier, uh, very stereotypically Jewish, Star of David, little child hanging off his gun, blood dripping all over these blood libels that, you know, Israelis harvest the organs of, of the Palestinians or, or all of these things that get people incited and ramped up. Um, look at this. If Jesus came to Israel today, so the, the blood-soaked Israeli flag, never mind that if Jesus came to Israel today, he's Jewish, um, but the Israeli police, like thugs, dragging him away. They've made, in this one, Jesus isn't even Jewish. He's wearing the Palestinian keffiyeh. Do not kill him twice. It's kind of like this inverted Islamic Christ killer accusation, right? That, oh, don't kill him twice. And here's Mary with a, a Palestinian Jesus. Uh, uh, here, you don't even know if it is a, an Israeli. It's just a, a caricature is supposed to be a Jew with a yarmulke, Star of David, fangs, and he's eating a child. And then, of course, President Obama. Um, being controlled by the, the state of Israel. Um, and look at these, World War II era. So the, the, the Jew is, is inferior and he's trying to manipulate the race and always leading this Aryan woman away. Um, hey Rabbi, what you doing? You know, claiming that, oh, it's Jews who are the ones spray painting the swastikas. They're all behind this because normal people don't do that, right? That's like what's implying. And then look at this, enemy Jews exposed. This is modern um, anti-Semitism in cartoons today. So it's like Jews are behind everything. Bad in society, according to whoever made this. And so these things, and why I go through this, is because these things end up and fuel the, the emotions behind these communities. Whether Muslim or non-Muslim, um, in, in uh, France, these kinds of things are very popular and end up on the signs they carry in the marches. Um, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in, uh, in French. This is, a, I believe, a World War II edition. Arabic, English, Mein Kampf in French. And here's a copies of Mein Kampf in Arabic and being sold on, in, uh, uh, you know, in the Arab world on book displays and different things like this. And so, you know, Mein Kampf, of course, we all know that. The Protocols of the Zion, a, an obvious forgery, a proven forgery that was created by the Russian secret police claiming that the Jew key Jewish leaders of the world got together to figure out how to take over the world and control everybody. And this thing won't die. I mean, even when the Israeli, uh, the IDF in the 80s uh, stormed the PLO headquarters in Lebanon, they found almost 200,000 copies of Mein Kampf and the Protocols because these things are being disseminated through their communities and published and read and believed. And uh, the protocols, I believe it was uh, an Egyptian um, media outlet just a few years ago did a whole mini-series on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. 
Um, when you think, especially when you think that Jews are less than one one thousandth of a percentage, you know, but eight billion people don't have a chance. Um, and, but these are the things that are perpetuated. And so in the European world, anti-Semitism has expressed itself in Jewish accusations of, of global power, corruption, these, uh, these accusations, the, that Jews control banks and money, controlling puppet governments. And we see a lot of these things blend right into the is anti-Israel um, march. Or deicide. You know, Jews are solely responsible for the, for the they killed God's son. And, and using that as an excuse to hate Jewish people and, and run them down and in, in the past kill them and still today. Um, Islamic anti-Semitism, which is quite interesting, it's still very much rooted in religious theological anti-Semitic rhetoric. So it's like um, where by the time we get to Hitler, a lot of the anti-Semitism uh, coming out wasn't necessarily connecting Jews with theological ideas. It was just saying they're inferior, they're like rats, they're like pests, we gotta get rid of them. But the, but the Islamic world that is very anti-Semitic, that shares that, is still in the, in the dark ages or a medieval mentality of their anti-Semitism. And so it comes out from the Islamic world as very theological. Um, the Jews are the enemies of Muhammad, they're the sons or the children of apes and pigs, they're, um, and there's certain hadiths that are read uh, that are, quote, the sayings of Muhammad. And of course, there's different sects of Islam, and some of them relate to these things differently than others. But these are serious issues. And even if it is a minority, which I believe it is, of, of Muslims that would get on a bus and blow themselves up, um, we're talking about a huge community of people. And, and so it is, there is cause for concern. This isn't being anti-Muslim or hating them, but it is a cause for concern to recognize the serious issues within their community. And there are some Muslim leaders that recognize that too. There are some Muslim leaders that recognize that too, and some Muslims that just completely ignore it um, and say, well, that just doesn't affect me, maybe I'm not part of that community, um, and they ignore it. But a lot, when you look at the um, Islamic anti-Semitism, it's interesting that it is, today, it's almost borrowed and continues to perpetuate an anti-Semitism of the medieval ages like the, and the 19th and 20th century um, of modern anti-Semitism. And an example is in the Hamas Charter, in their covenant as a terror organization, the Hamas Charter blames Israel and the Jews for starting the Russian Revolution and the Great Wars. And it even cites the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So it's like, it's kind of, they're in like this funny, weird area of being like medieval anti-Semites, kind of, and then blending 19th, 20th century anti-Semitism. And so this is a serious problem in much of the Muslim community. Many children are raised in communities where words such as Jew, Israel, or Zionist are like swear words. I know, I've talked with people from Muslim communities, and uh, these are like swear words. And when you think about how impressionable children are, I mean, it really is like a form of child abuse. It's like, uh, and not all these communities, but many of these communities are rearing their children to just hate Jewish people. Any association of, with, with a Jew, whether it's a, even symbols, a menorah or a star David, these are evil symbols. These are symbols that, uh, th that represent sending, or killing, the killing of Muslims or the, uh, controlling the world. And these are symbols and these are people to oppose. And so these things are ingrained in the, in the community, in many communities. And children learn this. They grow up with these beliefs and emotions. And these become part of their worldview an outlook on life far into adulthood. So it's a perpetual problem. That's why the government of France can maybe say, we stand against anti-Semitism, we gotta root it out from, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've even heard that at Prime Minister's questions in England. They're ta always talking about it. Will you condemn it? Yes, but it, it keeps growing and manifesting below because they're not penetrating the communities for proper education and, in, and influencing. They're making political statements that are good statements, but they're not getting to the root of the problem. And so anti-Semitism continues to fester. It continues to affect much of the French secular alt-left and right society, as well as strong elements within the, the French Catholic Church that these things permeate and exist. And so why, Jews are, why Europe's Jews are fleeing once again? And we see this going, and I'll just close with just a few things. Um, like when you look at that, like that's just insane. 
really. And more Jews are, are leaving Europe and going to countries like Canada, the US, and Israel than ever before, before World War II. Like before that period, since 1948 and now, more Jews are, are leaving than ever before. So these are really worrisome things. When I lived in Israel, I lived in Jerusalem. My wife and I, we rented a flat. And the flat was owned by a Jewish man from Paris. Uh, Patrick, I don't even remember his last name, but I only met him twice in the, the year and a half, almost two years we were in that flat. And the one time I asked him, because he was a Zionist, I said, well, why don't you make Aliyah? He said, oh, I love Paris, I love France. Well, okay, well, then if you're not making Aliyah, why do, you, why do you own this place? And his first response was, so I have somewhere to go when it gets really bad. And that, I found, and that was probably, for me, one of the first times, I mean, I'd met French Jews before, but I'd never been able to ask a French Jew what they felt. And I wasn't even asking about anti-Semitism. We weren't even on the subject, but that was his first response. I have property in Israel, so I have a place to get out if I have to flee. And it, it's just, it, it boggles your, your mind. So immigration and Alia, uh, I'll close with just saying, tying a, a personal example with Bridges for Peace. We have, we have a program called Operation Project Rescue, sorry, Project Rescue, which help, helps um, Olim. We've helped over 60,000 Jews uh, make Aliyah, mostly from, the, from Eastern Europe. But the whole pendulum is like swinging. Yes, there are still Jews in Eastern Europe. And Ukraine is a dire, dire place. We have connections with Christians. It's like World War II. If you've ever watched films like Saving Private Ryan and you see bombed out houses and stuff like that, that's what it looks like. We have Christian people that are getting into their, their vans. They're not being paid. And they're driving into Jewish neighborhoods and getting shot at to rescue Jewish families that are, have been in their houses for weeks because there's mobs outside and these people are terrified for their lives that they're going to get murdered. And it looks like World War II, like bombed out buildings and stuff like this. But we've helped over 60,000. And the big thing that Israel is bracing for is a mass exodus, mass aliyah of French Jews. French Jews. This is a big thing. If you've been in Netanya, I mean... Hebrew and you hear Hebrew, Arabic are like the official languages, right? And you see all the signs also in English, the three. But when you're in Netanya, I mean, when I was in Netanya, the very first time I got asked a question in French and then Russian. And it, like, I think Hebrew was like third or fourth. And so there's like these absorption cities like Netanya, Carmiel, Ilat, though a lot of people don't want to go down to Ilat because it's super hot, and Tel Aviv. And, these, and even Jerusalem, where they're carving out French communities Art, artist colonies of all French Jews. It's incredible. And you'll hear it on the streets, French. Like, they're not speaking Hebrew. I mean, they know Hebrew, a lot of them. But they're speaking French among themselves. And so Israel is bracing for this new influx of hundreds of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of Jews that'll just want to get out. And Bridges for Peace is a part of bracing for that as well. And our leadership is even in talks and strategizing, uh, both with the Ministry of Interior, both within our uh, own organization about how we can help the Jews of France. And so thank you. I'm going to also uh, introduce our panelists. Hopefully I didn't go too long. My wife says I talk too much. Maybe I talk too much. Okay.